Hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage Intact and the Intact Conservation Institutes, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Dr. S. Suresh, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rohila, Director of ICI Delhi. Now to introduce our speaker, Dr. Seturaman Suresh is an archaeologist, architectural historian, and tourism consultant based in Chennai, India. He is presently also the Tamil Nadu State Convener for INTAC. He has been the Samuel Crest International Lecturer for the Archaeological Institute of America in Boston for the academic year 2018. He is the first Indian and first Asian to be nominated for this prestigious lectureship. Simultaneously in 2018, he had been adjunct professor in the Department of Classics, Religion and Philosophy at the University of Mary Washington in Virginia teaching a unique course offered first time by any college or university in the world entitled Greek and Roman Travel and Trade in the East. Dr. Suresh was a Fulbright Senior Research Fellow at the National Trust for Historic Preservation in US and the School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation of the University of Maryland, USA in 2011 and Fulbright Academic and Professional Excellence Lecturing Fellow again at University of Mary Washington, Virginia 2015 to 16. Earlier, he was a research scholar at the British Museum London on an NLAC scholarship and also a research fellow at Linda Gandhi National Center for Arts in New Delhi and the French Institute of Pondicherry, India, and the Nehru Visiting Fellow at the Victoria and Albert Museum London. He's been awarded the Intact Sarpe Award 2011 for his contribution to heritage tourism and the PL Gupta Memorial Medal the South Indian Humanistic Society in 2013 for his research on Roman coins found in India. He holds a master's and MPhil degree in history and archaeology and a PhD from the University of Madras in classical archaeology from the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and another PhD in medieval Indian art from the University of Mysore. His areas of work and research include documentation and conservation of heritage sites, monuments, historical preservation legislation and policies, museum management and gallery display techniques, and making archaeology and heritage related data accessible and attractive to the wider public through workshops, exhibitions, heritage tours, and walks, publications, and films. He has authored over 35 books, including school and college textbooks, exhibition catalogs, tourist guidebooks, travelogues, and historical novels. He's most well known for the unique tours to archaeological sites, monuments, and museums in India and Cambodia that he designs and conducts for schools, colleges, museums, and corporate houses. The title for today's talk is Painting Hiding, Hiding Behind Painting. The rediscovery and restoration of the murals in the big temple of Tanjavur in Tamil Nadu, India. Tracing the long and eventful history of the conservation of the big temple of Tanjavur, the present lecture for the first time attempts a comprehensive collation and analysis of the various stages in the long process of conservation of the Chola paintings. The pioneering but unknown efforts of the Nayak and Tanjavur Maratha dynasties between the 16th and 18th century and the more scientific and systemic effort of the present day conservators. The lecture is based on extensive field studies and archival sources, besides personal interviews with senior archeologists involved in the conservation at different times. Before I invite Dr. Suresh, may I please request all of you to mute your microphones. Please tap in your questions in the chat box. We'll be taking those right at the end of the talk. And also type in your name, email ID and organization. Over to you, Dr. Suresh. Thank you so much for helping to do this talk. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on whichever part of the globe you are. Now, thank you, Padma, and thank you to INTAC for this wonderful opportunity. As many of you may be knowing, it's a very interesting prestigious and informative series on conservation. And I'm thankful to the INTAC authorities for inviting me in this series. And today's talk 
is mainly based on my MPhil thesis, which uh, for which I worked at the Department of Ancient History and Archaeology of the University of Madras. I wanted to do something on conservation, and the professors there suggested that the historical and technical aspects of conservation of certain monuments like the Sun Temple at Konarak in Odisha in Eastern India, and of course the Taj are well documented, but the equally painstaking work in certain other monuments have not been documented and publicized. And I being from Tamil Nadu and working in the University of Madras, I could think of doing that for the Tantric Temple. And that was my thesis. And the painting restoration was an important chapter of that thesis which was later developed by me into a full-fledged research paper and a series of lectures which were very well received in the US and UK. And here I'm happy to present a part of that for you under this series. At the outset, let me thank all my professors who helped me for this thesis. Professor A. Swami, Professor C. Krishnamurti, Professor S. Gurumurti, and Professor Shanmugam of the Department of Archaeology in the University of Madras. And also, I am proud and happy to record the help guidance received by me from the Archaeological Survey of India, which administers and maintains this monument. Notably, I was blessed with opportunities to discuss and get guidance from some senior archaeologists of the Archaeological Survey of India, the ASI in short. Notably, Mr. K. R. Srinivasan, Mr. K.V. Soundar Rajan, Dr. S. Paramashivan, who was an archaeological chemist, and they were of the earlier generation who did the pioneering work. Much later, others came, and they also helped me a lot in the research. Mr. G. Ramachandran, again an archaeology chemist, Mr. M. G. Chellapillai, Mr. Audishesha Reddy, and many others. So, here we begin. It's a story that I'm going to share with you, which is of technical interest, academic interest, historical interest, and human interest, all rolled in one. It's the story of the rediscovery and restoration of the Chora temples, of the sorry, of the Chora murals in the big temple of Tanjabu. And the talk and the study is part of a wider study of the general conservation of the temple itself. Just a few maps, many of you, I'm quickly going to go through the maps. I would presume all of you know the location of most of the places that I would be mentioning. Detailed maps of South India and Tamil Nadu with the location of Tanjavur. The imperial Choras, as all of you know, ruled from around the mid 9th to the early 13th century. And they built thousands of temples all over South India and a few in Sri Lanka, of which a few hundreds have survived now and have been documented by scholars. Now, of the thousands of temples built by them, we have five major ones, of which three have been declared as World Heritage Sites by UNESCO. The Bhradishwara Temple of Tanjore, declared as World Heritage as early as 1987. And then the first of the Chora temples, although there's a slight controversy on that, is the one at Nartha Malai, which they say architecturally and otherwise, it's a transition from the earlier architecture styles to the huge Chora temple style. The Vijayalaya Chorishwaram, built 
by the first imperial chola dynasty king in the mid 9th century and then we have the one built soon after the big temple of tanjore again confusing for scholars and tourists also called the brihadeeshwara temple at gangai konda cholapuram if the tanjore temple was built by the father this one was built by the son and then you have the airavatishwara temple at darasuram uh, built 100 years later around the mid 12th century i put a photograph with the scaffolding on when the con that darasuram temple also has a long and colorful history of conservation which i have not studied in as much a detail as i did for the big temple since it's a talk on conservation i rather chose this picture than any other picture and this darasuram temple and gangai konda cholapuram were declared world heritage by unesco in 2004 in fact all these three temples together constitute the great living chola temples as per unesco then you have the kampahareshwara temple at tirubuvanam very close to kumbakonam built by the one of the very last chola kings kulotunga the third and so that if narthamalai was the first the tirubuvanam temple is the last now of all these temples many of them have paintings but not of the chola period now coming to these five major temples uh, narthamalai and gangai konda cholapuram have paintings on the walls inside of the 15th to 18th century very late period done by one of the later late medieval dynasties the gangai konda cholapuram painting are definitely by the tanjavur maratha kings but the big temple of tanjore it's called the brihadeeshwara temple also called the rajarajeshwara temple after its founder rajaraja the one who ruled from 985 to 1014 ad and but for the locals to make the name short i'm using the same name it's just the periyakovil or the big temple obviously on account of its massive size if it has a tall tower rising to over 60 meters the main campus is a quadrangular one some 122 meters by 241 meters almost a rectangle a huge one and so that is the big temple and that has paintings in at least seven different places in the premises done by at least three different dynasties probably no other temple can claim such a distinction kanchipuram has paintings by three different dynasties but in different temples of the town but here in tanjavur we have three dynasty paintings within a single temple the chola the nayak and also the tanjavur maratha and so that makes this temple unique from the perspective not only of architecture and art but more so particularly with regard to paintings now before we go on to the core of today's talk which is basically the story of the rediscovery and restoration of these chola paintings within the big temple i'm just going to touch upon from my own thesis a few interesting aspects just a few old photographs to show you of because the painting conservation the painting story as i told you earlier is part of a bigger story of the entire temple conservation so now i'm showing you a plan it's an old plan i'm deliberately i didn't put a new one which is available on the google which all of you would know and can access it this old one shows the temple as it was more than 100 years ago with all the recent restoration removing of some of the accretionary walls put up by later rulers the layout and plan has slightly changed 
Now, just to give you some pictures, this is the main shrine, and adjoining it, you see the Chandesha sub shrine. And at the far end, you see the two entrance towers, one five stories tall, and the inner one three stories or three levels tall. And then you have the goddess, sorry, this one is the one for Subramanya, the one to the north of the main shrine, a gem of Nayak period architecture, 15th, 16th century. Although originally built by the Choras, the temple has structures of the Vijayanagar Nayak, Pandya, and Tanjavur Maratha dynasties. And the Tanjavur Maratha kings, who ruled from around 1676 to 1855, a long list of around 20 kings, they did a lot to conserve and preserve this temple as per the technology and knowledge that they had. And it was a pioneering work. Long before modern concepts of archaeological conservation took root, they did a lot. Long before the Natukotai Chetiyars and others, these Maratha kings did a lot. And among them was Sarfoji II, who ruled from 1798 to 1832. You see him here in this painting picture from the Tanjavur Maratha Palace in Tanjore. And he is seated along with his son, who is standing to his left, Shivaji II, the last king of that dynasty, after which the dynasty ended, thanks to the British colonial policy of expanding territories in India. Lord Dalhousie put in his novel policy of doctrine of lapse, that any kingdom where the ruler dies without a biological heir to the throne, without a biological son, the kingdom would pass on to the British, of course, under certain conditions. And Shivaji II died without a son, leaving behind two daughters. And in 1855, Tanjavur passed on to the British. And Sarfoji II, that was the most famous king, the father and predecessor of Shivaji II, the last king. And he was the one who did a lot for art and architecture and literature in Tanjavur, including for the big temple. And right from the Chora times, this temple was considered a royal shrine, like the Kailasnatha temple of Kanchipuram of the Pallavas, or the Virupaksha temple of Pattadakkal for the Western Chalukyas, or the much later Virupaksha temple of Hampi for the Vijayanagar kings. But the Tanjavur Maratha kings had multiple royal shrines, and they took efforts to preserve all of them. And this is a Tanjavur Maratha painting, Goddess Saraswati, the goddess of learning and her attendance within the big temple. And here you have the Ganesha sub-shrine fully rebuilt because it was the one of the earlier period had collapsed and the Sarfoji II had to fully rebuild this structure. So the rebuilt shrine is of the Tanjavur Maratha period, early 19th century. This is the Nataraja sub-shrine within the same temple housing the gigantic bronze Nataraja today. And it was fully built by the Marathas. And hence, you see, although they took care to use the a type of stone which matches in texture and color to the other parts of the old structure, the ornamentation and style is distinctly different from other sub shrines. This is one of the other royal shrines of the Tanjavur Maratha dynasty, the Chandramaulishwara temple for Shiva within the palace complex, still in use exclusively by the royal family within the palace. Public access to it is restricted unless one goes through the royal family. The Punnai Nallur Mariamman temple, little away from Tanjavur, another equally important royal shrine of this dynasty. Now we are back to the core temple of ours, the big temple, and it, it, it has attracted scholars 
poets and others from early days and when modern day archaeology took root in india and monuments were to be conserved the big temple of tanjore naturally was one of the first choices of the colonial government and after the establishment of the archaeological survey of india the asi in 1861 the big temple began to be conserved by the asi from the late 19th century and they did a lot for the structural conservation of the monument much before taking up the paintings inside this is an old photograph which shows the temple slightly different from what you see today some of these barricades and iron railings are all gone then this is a beautiful picture i consider it it shows the temple nearly more than 50 60 years ago my grandfather and his brother used to say they have seen it this way we can see it only in the photographs of the asi they at some point probably during the maratha rule certain accretionary walls were built and what k r srinivasan mentioned to me in an oral interview unplanned and ill grown garden was developed within the premises of the temple and naturally as per international norms of conservation the asi had to remove these to make it conform to the original plan and layout of the temple as conceived by its builders the cholas so what we see today is this then you have the Keralaan Thakan Gopuram, the inner three-tiered Gopuram. I had shown you a color picture of it. You see it here, covered with fungus before conservation. You can see part of it being restored, and how good it looks here after the conservation process was completed by the 1970s. Now again, the tower above one of the smaller sub shrines in the temple before and after conservation when it was being conserved you see half of the tower still to be conserved the other half after the process is over then the most interesting the main tower rising to over 60 meters tall with its capstone at the top many of you would know the story that it was originally believed to us to be a single circular stone some 81.34 tons in weight but now it's proved that it consists of three parts very beautifully and skillfully joined together each part obviously taken separately and joined at the great height and this was this vimana or tower above the main sanctum which has intricate carvings and crevices has been a challenge for the archaeologists and conservators with regard to fungus formation vegetation growth and uh, cracks water see page from the top but then they have done a very good job of it and that's closely related to the painting conservation because the paintings are seen at the lower level of this edifice and here you see the conservation process in the final stages and now we are coming to the history of the painting itself before i tell you the process of the painting the history the process and the rediscovery and the restoration are all equally dramatic and mesmerizing now when the uh, choras built the temple they planned it it did not have as many sub shrines as it has today many of them as i told you came later the main shrine consists of a series of halls or mandabas ending in the small ardha mandaba beyond which is the main sanctum housing the shivalinga and the builders conceived it to the sanctum they wanted to have a pradakshina pada or a sarkam ambulatory passage around it and 
each of the four sides of this sanctum is having a vestibule and each vestibule is divided into five chambers. The demarcation of the ch each chamber being corresponding to the base or pilasters on the exterior wall, which as per architects has been done as per engineering requirements of structural stability. Thus, we have the four vestibules, each with chambers corresponding to the base or pilasters on the exterior, such that each vestibule joins the neighboring vestibule at right angles, sharing a common corner chamber. This line drawing, I did it for my thesis. It's from my thesis, and I'll, it's one of my favorites, and for this talk, I feel this is the most important slide. I'll be coming back to it again and again. And so you have 15 chambers numbered by modern day archeologists. Please note the Chodas or Nayaks did not number it. The ASI, we have numbered it for our own convenience. And now whatever number ASI has given, we are following it. And it has been numbered in clockwise direction, as you see, beginning from 1 and ending at 15. On the eastern vestibule alone, the middle chamber is absent, the place being occupied by the entrance from the sanctum to the Ardha Mandava for this east-facing temple. And you could also observe, in the because that's important for the painting story, just see chamber four, chamber eight, and chamber 12. Just uh, you would see for these three chambers, which are in the middle or center of the corresponding or respective vestibules, there is opening on the outside. That was deliberately made by the Choras. It was like a window opening, of course, with no jali or any uh, screen on them, just an opening to allow light and ventilation to the corridor, which otherwise would have turned completely dark. And that was how the corridor was intended. And devotees were to enter it through chamber one, what we call chamber one, circumambulate the deity and go out through chamber 15. And the Choras, when they built it, they covered the entire vestibule on all the four sides, right from chamber 1 to 15, with paintings on the ceiling and on the walls, right from the top to the floor level. And these paintings, most of them portray scenes from Shiva's life, Shiva being the main deity in this temple and the favorite deity of the Chora period. For example, Chamber 7 is an important one which shows incidents from the life of Sundaramurti Nayana, one of the devotees of Shiva, all his life incidents which uh, form part of Hindu mythology are part of the painting in Chamber 7. Chamber 9 has some interesting paintings of God Shiva being worshipped by his devotees. And Chamber 10 has an interesting panel showing Rajaraja, the king, the builder of the temple, along with his guru or preceptor Karuvur Devar. A very rare instance of the builder of a temple thinking of his teacher while executing the paintings. And also, this is one of the rare representations of Rajaraja. We come to know how he looked from this painting. Of course, there are bronzes and other sculptures of his, but this painting, among painting, it's the only one. And since it was done during his lifetime, definitely, we take it to be more authentic. And so that was how the uh, vestibule was formed and the paintings were done. And 
The temple was consecrated around 1010 AD and worship began. And by the 15th century, with 400 years of worship and the perpetual burning of oil lamps and the frequent burning of camphor within the sanctum, they resulted in a lot of smoke and soot which covered the paintings and the paintings started flaking. And by that time, the Chora rule had ended and the Tanjavur Nayak dynasty had taken over Tanjavur rule. And the Nayak dynasty was equally attached to this temple and they were keen on maintaining it. They did build a few structures within it, including that beautiful Subramanya sub shrine, which I showed you a few minutes ago. And when they saw this chamber with the painting flaking off, they felt that it had to be painted afresh. So they repainted it over that. So this repainting by the Nayaks on the Chora painting should be viewed as part of a wider process of renovation or restoration of the entire temple. Not knowing any better means of restoring the damaged painting, which was flaking by the minute, they thought the only method available to them then was painting over them. And that's why, why they did it. And then after that, many incidents happened. The Nayak rule ended. The Tanjavur Maratha dynasty rule started in Tanjavur. And towards the end of the Nayak rule, we don't know the exact date. Even K.R. Srinivasan had doubts about the date. But somewhere around the end of the Nayak rule or the beginning of the Maratha rule, even I couldn't find any Day records confirming the date. At some point of time, again, please look at this slide. The opening adjoining chamber 4, 8, and 12 were closed up with mud walls. We wouldn't know why, when. It was somewhere around that 17th, 18th century. And why they did it and made the passage totally dark is a big mystery, but it was done. Probably the answer lies in later incidents which took place in the 18th century. Tanjavur was a major center of the clashes between the French and the British in India. There were many places which witnessed the Anglo-French clashes and Tanjur was one. And the big temple unfortunately fell a victim to it. Worship stopped for a few years and the clashes went on right inside the temple. On the northern wall of the main shrine, we still have some damaged portions of the wall, which are supposed to be bullet marks. And this painted chamber adjoining the sanctum with the mud walls closing up even the three openings, that was providing an ideal hideout for the military forces. They say it was a military hideout used both by the French and the British alternatively. You can imagine the damage that would, the paintings would have suffered those days. Then finally, the Anglo-French rivalry ended. Worship was restarted in the temple. That was in 18th, early 19th century, Sarfoji II had taken over the throne of Tanjavu and he embarked upon an ambitious program to restore and repair the temple, which he did. And inscriptions on the walls of the temple and records in the Saraswati Mahal library of Tanjavu within the palace describe some of the conservation efforts initiated by Sir Foji, which is part of my book on Tanjavur Maratha Art and Architecture. And he rebuilt the Ganesha sub-shrine, erected a new sub-shrine for Nataraja, and did so much of other restoration works. And obviously, we feel he did not know about the Chora paintings hiding beneath the Nayak paintings, but the chamber was cleaned and the paintings were dusted. They were not retouched and were left as it is. 
and of course because the interior had now become very dark bats was a big menace bats were there all over the passage and they were causing more damage to the paintings and the dropping of the bats was a valuable plant manure and periodically it was removed and sold and so it gave a small revenue to the temple so the temple authorities encouraged it but not knowing the damage that the bats were causing to the paintings within the passage around the 1920s probably due to heavy rain or thunderstorm one of the walls of the one of the three walls accidentally gave way and the, this resulted in some lighting for the passage and more people began to go around it it the admission was not restricted as it is today but people would not go because it was dark but then with one wall giving way uh, one of the three walls the more people began to visit it and uh, uh, go around the passage going around the sanctum in march 1931 something dramatic happened professor s k govinda swami a professor of history from annamalai university chidambaram he came along with some of his students to visit the temple and they say he was going round this passage observing the painting and probably explaining the paintings to the students when they observe a shower of fragments falling down initially they thought that the stone was breaking but a closer observation by the professor and his companions revealed that what was coming off loose was the flaking nayak paintings revealing the chora painting inside which was gently peeping out after centuries of hiding and so credit goes to sk govind swami for rediscovering the chora paintings in march 1931 the hindu newspaper from madras today's chennai and many other newspapers have given good coverage to this rediscovery and a photograph of sk govind swami can still be seen in the small museum within the temple he published a small paper on this rediscovery and the circumstances leading to it in the journal of the annamalai university in 1933 soon there was a great interest in these paintings because all along we have been having a mistaken notion that india especially south india is known for its sculptures and not paintings that's a something it's a wrong notion and now this rediscovery was trying to set that record straight and so lot of interest was there on these paintings more people began to visit it and a team of the archaeological survey of india was to come from delhi to rameshwaram on official work and they specially made a detour to visit this temple and see the paintings the next stage was to analyze the paintings and try to find out more about the technique and also then initiate steps to preserve the paintings and for this along with the staff of the archaeological survey chemistry branch dr s parameshivan who was originally in the government museum in madras he was invited to help uh, study the paintings and he published his first ever paper on the technique of these paintings at harvard in 1937 which was a landmark publication unfortunately not easily accessible or accessed by many scholars in india and later of course more papers on these paintings have been published at the archaeological survey of india initiated systematic efforts to conserve these paintings from the 1940s now the drawing that i showed you from the thesis this is a color picture of that and then you have a photograph of the corridor one of the corridors themselves neatly carpeted with 
lamps at electric bulbs at regular intervals to spotlight on the paintings. Now, these coming to the technique, that has been a slight controversy, but after Parameshivan, some more tests were done. And now it has been conclusively proved. This has created ripples in certain circles, but we are sure because a series of tests have been done. As many of you would know, fresco, the word fresco is a much misinterrupted word. It's being loosely used. Even a house or a palace or a church having paintings, they claim they are frescoes. We think fresco is a painting. Many of us do not know that fresco is a type of painting, a very specialized, difficult type at that. Anyway, the, we have a lot of frescoes, and as many of you would know, the most famous one, among the most famous, are the ones on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. And frescoes have been there throughout. They became very popular in medieval Europe. In India, after the Europeans began to colonize large parts of India in the Middle Ages, beginning with the Portuguese, the Dutch, the Danes, the French, and the British, we have many churches and other buildings where they did paintings on the walls. Often the European artists did the murals, and it has now been discovered that at least some of them are frescoes, true fresco, and if we do proper testing, we may discover more frescoes in Northern Karnataka, Goa, many, many other places. But coming here, right in Tanjavu, these Chora paintings have been identified as fresco, done as early as the 10th century, long before any of the Brit British or other European colonial powers even thought of setting foot on India. Now, how they did it was, as you see on in this picture, the entire temple is built of rough, strong, heavy, dark colored granite. And this granite wall provided the tooth or the base surface for the painting. Since the granite floor was uneven, they had to lay a good plaster and the Thickness of the plaster varied from place to place depending upon the undulating or different contours of the granite walls, which was not even at all. And the average thickness was around 2.5 to 2.6 millimeter, sorry, inches. And then it, that plaster itself was done in two stages. The First layer, both the layers were consisting of lime and lime, which is calcium oxide and sand, which were the basic ingredients. But the quantity was different. And in the, for example, in the Chora frescoes, the initial layer of the plaster had more sand, around 66% sand and just 7% lime. But then the next layer was totally different. It had more of lime and less of sand, which means the plaster was graded with sand as the inner material, a technique very common in Europe, but it was not unknown in India, and it, we see it in Tanjavu. And then on this, after the second layer, of, the second layer of plaster was done, even while the first layer was wet, and on the second layer, they executed the painting in true fresco or fresco buono technique while the plaster was still wet. And as those of you familiar with fresco would know that they had to do it while the plaster was wet. Otherwise, it can't be called fresco. And in the process, the water in the wall evaporates after some time and lime absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, giving the painted surface a layer, a shiny layer of crystalline carbonate, which makes the pigments lock themselves, I'm using the chemist's word, lock themselves into the wall, and 
become almost insoluble in water and also give the painting a very peculiar sheen characteristic of true fresco. You observe this very much in the Tanjavur paintings. Of course, apart from sand and lime, we have traces of iron and magnesium in the plaster. Marble and gypsum, well-recognized ingredients in the painting plasters in Europe are unknown in Tanjavur, obviously because South India and the Chora Empire was totally not having marble or gypsum. We have some marble deposits in North India and some gypsum in Rajasthan, very far from the Chora Empire. Now, one more thing about the frescoes is that since this has to be done while the plaster is wet, which means after the plaster is done, within the next few hours, 5, 6, 10, or maximum 12 or 20 hours, definitely not more, but much less than that, the entire painting has to be completed. And when a huge whole wall has to be done, naturally, we... We, one may not be able to do the painting on the entire wall in a single day. So they would put the plaster on a part of the wall, paint the wall and put more plaster on the remaining part of the wall the next day and paint that part. In such a process, one would see plaster joint marks between the plasters done on different days. It's inevitable. However careful one would do that, and we have seen such joint marks, even I have seen it in fresco plasters in many other sites. But in Tanjavur, these joint marks are not visible at all. There are only two possibilities. Either they had already planned the theme of the painting, got all the pigments ready, and got a team of artists to do it, and when the entire wall, it was a long wall, it was laid with plaster and different groups of artists executed different panels simultaneously so that all the work on that wall is completed before the plaster on that wall gets dry. This may not have been an impossible task or another possibility is each of the painted panels is divided or demarcated by beautiful floral borders and they could have done one panel per day and hidden the plaster joints intelligently under the board. Either way, it shows the skill of the Chora artists. So now these are the plaster ingredients which I mentioned. And then coming to the paint pigments, blue was from lapis lazuli. Again, lapis lazuli is not available in South India. The nearest source would be Badakshan in Afghanistan. But then Choras did have trade contacts with many kingdoms, so they could have got it. And light blue was obtained by mixing the ultramarine with lime. And then yellow, brown, and red from locally available occurs. Flesh tint intelligently made by mixing red and white. And black was initially suspected to be lamp black or charcoal because we often have this mistaken notion in olden times they used vegetable dyes and all things were done by squeezing leaves and vegetables, beetroot and all that. They did use it, but they also used chemical or mineral colors. And now it has been proved the black in the Chora frescoes is manganese dioxide. Thus, all, most of the colors used in the Chora frescoes are mineral-based, not vegetable-based. And now I'm showing you some of the paintings. This one is well-preserved and very famous in many picture postcards, books, and other places. The, a black and white old picture of the same, Rajaraja and his guru. The other ones are heavily damaged. The one showing Sundaramurti Nayanar and his life story and Shiva being worshipped by devotees and so on. And now these, pain, uh, now these are the frescoes in the Sistine Chapel in Rome. And most recently, while on a Fulbright program, I got to see the frescoes in US. Apart from churches, the 
inside of the cupola or the dome of the Capitol. The U.S. Parliament in Washington, D.C. has some true fresco within it. And so these paintings, the fresco Chora paintings, now it dispels the notion that South India was not having good painters or good paintings. It, the art historians consider these Chora paintings to be the culmination of a long tradition of painting. Dating back to the prehistoric times, we have prehistoric paintings in Nilgiris in Tamil Nadu, in Purivarai and a few other places. And then the Sangam literature of the first two centuries AD do have copious references to painting, paint brushes, and in, in, significantly they do refer to plaster made of lime and sand. And then we have Coming to extend paintings, we have the Kailasanatha temple, the forerunner of the Bradishwara temple as a royal temple, the Kailasanatha of Kanchipuram built by the Pallavas, which has these 56 sub-shrines within which are traces of paintings. They had much more, but much of it is gone now. And then the same ruler, same period, not too far from Kanchi, the Talagirishwara temple at Panamalai, again having a beautiful Parvati painting noted for her headdress. And of course, we have one in Sittanavashal around the same period, around 6th century, further deep south in Tamil Nadu. Then, of course, the famous ones in Ajanta Elora. Ajanta one, this is and which is basically Buddhist, but none of these are true fresco, including Ajanta. Many of them are tempera. And coming to the Nayak paintings, which were done above the Chora paintings, the Nayaks made another plaster. We, we now feel that probably they, at some point, they knew about the Chora plaster because the Chora paintings were flaking off. It may, in chamber one, two, three, and four, we have no Chora painting below the Nayak painting at all, which means by the time the Nayaks started repainting, the Chora paintings had totally vanished in these four chambers obviously revealing the plaster itself because the plaster constituents and even the thickness of the Nayak plaster is almost the same as the Chora plaster. And the exact technique of execution of the Nayak plaster is not full, uh, uh, unequivocally determined till now. We need more tests to be done, but definitely it's not true fresco. Although it's five centuries younger than the Chora paintings, its adherence to the base or plaster is much weaker than the Chora paintings. And of course, with regard, they, it may be tempera, but we have to do further chemical and scientific analysis to confirm that. And coming to the paint pigments, again, they used almost the same pigments and ochres as the Chora paintings. Now, these Nayak paintings, they bore the brunt of the damage. That is something which we have to note. The, now we are coming to the crux of the topic. The rediscovery is over. It's the restoration, the final part. The, we are now far beyond 1940s. The rediscovery and all the excitement about this is over. And then the uh, uh, archaeologists wanted to restore it. And so they had to do a series of measures. One thing that they observed was the Nayak painting really proved to be a protective layer over the Chora painting. If the Nayaks had not painted over the Chora paintings, we may not have had, we may have had hardly any Chora painting today for us to see and admire. During the Anglo-French rivalry and all those difficult times, all the damage to the painted wall was borne by the Nayak paintings, the Chora painting conveniently cocooned deep inside. And so the first step was to clear the passage of bats and bat droppings to prevent further infestation by bats. Tight fitting doors were fitted on the entry and exit of this passage. 
that is on the two sides of the Ardha Mandaba. If you go to the temple, you can go up to the Ardha Mandaba, not beyond. You will see two huge polished wooden doors, one leading to chamber one, one to chamber 15. They are, you would see them. And then the entrances or the openings adjoining chamber four, eight and 12 have also been closed with tight fitting doors. And the seepage of rainwater from the superstructure, which caused irreparable damage to the upper panel of paintings, while the lower panel suffered minimal impairment, that was also arrested. And after that, photographing the painting began to record the damage to the painting before conservation. That proved a major challenge in the 1950s when we did not have the powerful cameras and other technology that we have today, but that was also resolved by doing, by photographing the paintings bit by bit and joining the pieces together like a jigsaw puzzle. And after that, the restoration began. In the initial process, it was felt that there was no way of exposing the surviving Chora frescoes without chipping off the Nayak painting covering them. So th this was a destructive process, but then it was justified on the grounds that the Chora paintings are older and more valuable from the point of view of technique than the Nayak paintings. And moreover, Nayak paintings are seen in many other temples, but Chora paintings are unknown anywhere else. So in certain chambers, like chambers seven and nine, the Nayak painting was totally stripped off uh, to reveal the Chora paintings. It was around the early 1970s that some art lovers and officials of the ASI rightly felt that the Nayak paintings being over 400 years old, they also had their own heritage value in their own way and they should not be destroyed for merely exposing the Chora paintings lying underneath, which means a method had to be found to carefully detach the Nayak painting without causing any damage to either of them. That was a real challenge. And by then, they had a lot of studies had taken place. Our archaeologists and scientists look to the West where, to see if something similar had happened. Italy had developed enough techniques to transfer paintings from one wall to the other. Nearer home, Sir Aurel Stein had collected samples of wall paintings and rock paintings from Central Asia, which are till today preserved in the National Museum in Delhi. But in all those instances, the problem was simpler. They had, the wall had only one layer of painting, unlike Tanjavu. Now, there are two methods, as some of you would know, of doing, of detaching a painting from a wall, the strapo method and the distaco method. The strapo method in which only the paint layer is removed, leaving the plaster behind on the wall. The distaco method in which the paint layer is removed along with the underlying or supporting plaster. Initially, the archaeologists involved in the process felt that they should adopt the strapo method to remove the Nayak painting carefully, leaving behind its plaster and then maybe mounting it on, in a suitable frame for museum display and then carefully chipping off that Nayak plaster and to reveal the Chora painting on the wall. This would have been a safer method from the perspective the Chora painting lying behind, but the Nayak paint fragments appear to be too brittle to be removed without the underlying plaster. They would not survive the removal at all. So they had to adopt, they were compelled to adopt the more complicated distaco method. And they did it in a way, it, it, the uh, conservators there have shared their experiences, other archaeologists from the ASI have been kind enough to tell me the story, which is full of excitement and an inspiration for the whole world. They had to evolve methods. There was no precedent. There was no example to go by. What they did was, it was started around 1975 on the west wall of chamber 10. 
the after photographing and cleaning the particular painting they covered it with cloth initially they covered it with overlapping strips of thin weave network like weave cotton cloth as you see here in this picture and then over that they put a much thicker cotton canvas and the second cotton canvas was thicker than the earlier one and it had a free margin of 10 to 15 centimeters on all the four sides and this was stuck with 20 percent polyvinyl acetate solution such that there was no air bubbles between the layers of the cloth and they allowed the cloth and the adhesive to dry for several days and after that they started cutting along the edges of the Nayak painting starting from the left hand corner and after that they inserted a rubber tipped iron chisel to approve the Nayak painting but at every moment they were keeping an eye on the Chora painting that was being exposed underneath if any part of the chora painting was accidentally coming away along with the nayak plaster the entire operation was suspended till the chora paint plast paint layer was strengthened suitably chemically and then the operation was resumed and in between there was one more stage on this free margin of the cloth they put a wooden reaper and also supported it with props so that there is no chance of any accidental fall of the painting especially towards the final stages of this complex operation and it was a very slow labor intensive painfully slow process and the process is still on it's not complete uh, there are some more panels to be uncovered this way and once they uprooted the Nayak painting along with the panel, they put it on a table upside down. And they cleaned the back of the panel, rubbing it for any projections or bulges, and then stuck two layers of jute cloth, again with polyvinyl acetate on it, and over that put a layer of polyurethane fiber, and over that, they put fiberglass mat with epoxy resin with aluminium angles at the edges for further reinforcement. And after all these adhesives had dried, after several days, the Nayak painting was turned with its face upwards on the same table and the two layers of cloth that was sticking to the front of the painting were carefully removed and a preservative coat of polyvinyl acetate was put. That was with regard to the Nayak painting. And the Chora painting, uh, it was cleaned, and a, a, any patches, they were filled with plaster of Paris suitably tinted, and again, given a preservative coating of the PVA. Initially, it was felt that these detached Nayak paintings after being suitably mounted on fiberglass stands, could be placed on the corridor itself, the same corridor uh, where the Chora paintings are seen, so that to the visiting public, one could convey the message that these two paintings were there, one above the other, and it's to the credit of the modern day archeology span and technology that they have been detached carefully and they, the story can be told in situ, but the narrow size of the passage prevented this. And so these detached Nayak paintings are now exhibited in a small museum elsewhere within the same temple, while the Chora paintings are seen in the same passage. Presently, public are not allowed in the passage, rightfully so, because it's a narrow passage and uh, uh, the temple priests are not too happy having huge tourist groups next to the sanctum and the conservation work is still on. So uh, now and then we have groups of conservators still at work, but research scholars and others can approach the ASI for special permission to view it, which ASI would grant at its discretion. 
and definitely this is a very interesting story of rediscovery and restoration and which has very very few parallels anywhere in the world and it's regarded as one of the greatest achievements of indian archaeology and happy to have got this opportunity to share the story with you thanks to intact i hope you liked it thank you again thank you dr suresh for the wonderful public uh, presentation thank you so much um i would like so like to inform everyone that uh, subraman sir is there with us he i think he was the one who led the conservation work he was also part of intact so yeah. i so thank you for joining us sir so i don't see any questions um please type in your questions please do type in your questions because i don't see any questions i see a lot of remarks but no questions so far so no questions subaraman sir i like to thank him because i've been great i've not seen him or interacted with him as i did with some other members of asi team but i've been greatly inspired by his work and by his writings i would like to thank dr suresh i had the pleasure of going with you on the roman trail which i remember every little detail till today thank you bye raja yeah. raja chola is my hero supreme next comes michael angelo who released the soul from the stone thanks a lot for putting up a fantastic informative story line beautifully intercepted with your pictures expressions explanations i'm all the due credit to all your predecessors thank you okay. uh we have sorry I think we lost the connection, Doctor Suresh. There are questions. Yeah. Uh, we have one question. It mm -hmm. is, can you kindly repeat the ratio for first and second layer of plaster that was used? Okay, for both, uh, it's just slightly different for both Chora and Nayak. Let me tell you. Just give me a minute. For Chora, it was. 50 the initial layer or the inner layer was 50% of sand and 28% of lime and for the exterior layer it was 66% lime and a mere 7% sand i hope i got it correct you got it correct and the numbers are less number for sand in the second layer and more for sand in the first layer 50 and 28 50 is a higher number that is for sand in the first layer and 66 7 and 7 was the sand for the second layer so the amount of sand in the second layer or exterior layer comes down substantially this was the formula which we devised even to remember it for my mfil viva vosi and coming to the nayak painting it's a little little different but almost the same the first layer had 63.4% of sand and a mere 18.5% of lime while the second layer had 55.6% of lime and a mere 18 sorry 13.8% of sand again i'll repeat it it was 63.4 sand and uh, 18.5 sorry 63.4 lime and uh, sorry 63.4 lime uh, sand and 18.5 lime in the first layer inner layer and in the second layer the numbers are 13.8 of sand and 55.6 of lime once you remember the numbers the easy way to remember is the lower number is the sand for the upper layer and the uh, upper number is the sand for the inner layer i hope i was not too confusing thank you next question is how were the pigments identified 
what were the scientific analysis methods used for identifying the various pigments? I think that's a, it is a, I can share with them through email uh, because the, it was done at, by different people, by uh, conservators at different stages in different institutions and they adopted different methods. And so I do have the details of some of them. I can share it with whoever wants it uh, uh, through email or some other source, because I think if I start explaining, I'll have to do it pigment by pigment. It, it may not be possible right now. Okay. Um, if you can show your email ID, uh, which yeah, I'll again show it. I think I did show it. I'll again show it. I just, on your suggestion, I put this so that people, I know there would be a lot of questions, academic and otherwise, on the, this topic. So I've put it because there are how the painting was discovered and identified as fresco and where all they did the tests for. Uh, the pigment constituents and the plaster constituents. I do have the records and the personal interviews given to me by ASI officials. I can share them with you, whoever wants it, because it's too voluminous to be put on the slides or to discuss it, tell the whole story now. Okay. So analysis questions can be directed to Professor Suresh directly in the email and he'll definitely get back to you. The next question is, is there a measurement of light levels for the display lighting that was used and do they have a negative effect on the paintings, on these paintings? Uh, what are the light levels being used to display these paintings and do you think they will have a negative effect on the paintings? Now, uh... I'm not, to be frank, I'm not too sure on this. I've not thought about it much, but let me tell you what I've heard from the archeologists at the site. Naturally for any painting, it's true even for Ajanta Sigiriya in Sri Lanka, which they say was done as the same style as Ajanta, tempera, not fresco. And any place, even in Europe, we have been repeatedly told any light, continuous exposure to light, even to the flashlight of cameras and even to the light of mobile phones, painting would deteriorate, especially old paintings. So we, the, the general uh, guideline is to avoid too much light or bright light. And in Tanjavur, uh, as far as I know, they have put in the powerful 1000 watt bulbs at the floor level uh, in a particular angle that they focus on particular painted panels and these bulbs have been fitted unobtrusively because if they put it in the middle of the wall, naturally it won't look nice and it may even uh, mar the viewing of some of the painting or at least some details of a particular panel. So the archaeologists have intelligently planned to put it at, at the base level and uh, show a spotlight on the painting. In any case, as far as the Tanjore uh, temple corridor, you can see some of the bulbs. They are concerned. The uh, uh, passage is not open to the public at all. So uh, if at all there's any person who has applied for special permission, and mostly I'm told it's given only for academic reasons. They don't want to encourage tourism. Tourists can as well view the museum where they get to know this full story of the painting and see photographs of the Chora paintings and the detached Nayak paintings. So whoever comes in in the passage or when the ASI cleans the passage or does further conservation work, only at, th at those times these lights are on. Otherwise, the passage is always kept closed and the lights are also switched off. So we don't expect any damage to these paintings due to lighting at the moment. But uh, to what extent these paintings are sensitive to light, I'll have to check up with experts. Okay. The next question is um, any interaction, the, also with the interaction of water and soot, uh, was there any salt efflorescence, observe the problems of salt efflorescence and damage? Uh, if I'm getting the question right, was it was there any salt damage on the paintings? Was, yeah, salt for deposition of salt observed on the paintings because you did say that the water ingress was there and one there was soot and mud. So any chance was there an incident of 
salt efflorescence damage on these paintings? No, not to the extent that I know of, because water seepage was because the, you know, it's a hollow tower. The Vimana is hollow beyond the second floor level. And there were crevices and water was seeping in and uh, it did come right up to the painted passage. And we are told there have been old ASI reports and other papers of the early 20th century, which clearly mentioned that the paintings did da got damaged due to water ingression in the interior and they also clearly mentioned the upper panels were more damaged than the lower ones but there is no mention of salt ingression as far as i know okay thank you the next question is are there any efforts being made to study the pigments of the nayaka paintings and then those which one we can find from the remnants of the chola painting scheme is this a work plan that has been adopted? And if yes, do we notice any difference in the painting school and pigment selection in both these styles? It's a very interesting and relevant question. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll have to sort of consult more with the ASI people. But a general observation is that the uh, Nayak paintings have not been studied in general as much as a Chora painting. You would know why. Obviously, because the Chora paintings raised more excitement and more uh, sort of uh, more interest both among academicians and others. But definitely, they're, they're, they're at some point, and the conservation process is not complete. They are still in the process of uh, exposing some more chamber walls, uh, uh, the Chora paintings in those walls. So at some point, I would put it this way, the ASI would definitely try do an analysis of the Nayak paint pigments and also try to determine the exact technique of execution of the Nayak paints and also more about their pigments and then compare it with the Chora. We know more of the Chora paintings and their pigments than of the Nayak. And at some point, ASI would definitely do it. Okay, thank you. The next question again is, what is the general way of dealing? Is there a general way of dealing with such palimpsests where both the older sets of painting, well, if both the sets of paintings were old, and here it was a clear choice between Chola and Nayak paintings, where we went for the Cholas, as you rightly said, with reasons that were given. But if both the sets were to be equally important, what do you think, what would you suggest would be a way forward in those cases? As I told you, the, at this site, it's hats off to our conservators at the site. They had to evolve a process. As far as I know, in fact, in many books we have mentioned, rightly so, it's unique. I try to be safe by saying it's one of the few in the world or in this part of the world, but we can quite safely say it's almost the first time in the whole world. They, we have not had such a problem elsewhere and the conservators at the site evolved a method to resolve it. So from your question, if there are two layers of painting, both here also, when they started the process, they did consider the Nayak ones to be as important as the Chora, so that that should, should not be damaged. That old school of thought was there in the 1960s and 70s, uh, 50s, when they, uh, they, at that time, the technology and awareness was not as much as it is now or even in the 70s. So now if you come across encounter, I think you have one precedent. They, of course, in any other site, what is true for the big temple may not be applicable, but definitely this can prove an inspiration and all the available records and literature on this process and hopefully the experiences of the conservators at this site could be profitably utilized in the other site to detach the upper layer from the inner layer without causing any damage to either of them. But as I again repeat, much depends on the technique of the two paintings, the age of the paintings, and also the strength of the painting, whether they can stand, they be removed with the plaster or without the plaster. All these things may have to be determined before any particular method is being adopted. True. Very true. So I, I don't see any 
to the questions. I think we've taken up most of the questions that have been put. So thank you so much, Dr. Suresh, for the presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us. No. Thank you. Yeah, any thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think it was a wonderful presentation. Um, very, I mean, it's glad to know about the South Indian fresco well that's been revealed. Thank you, everyone, for attending the talk. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.